Today we are also pleased to honor Roberta L. Gill, Gibb, who is, an, is an unfortunately ill and not able to be with us. She is a 1977 graduate of New England Law who broke the gender barrier 50 years ago when she became the first women, woman to run the Boston Marathon. She exemplifies the pioneering spirit demonstrated by the early women graduates of our law school. We honor her for her role in expanding the, the horizons of women. I now ask Chief Justice I now ask Chief Justice McLaughlin to step forward. It is my privilege to introduce the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin, the first female Chief Justice of Canada and the longest serving Supreme Court Justice in Canadian history. Known as a consensus builder and a frequent writer of court opinions, she strives to provide clarity in the court's judgments for legal professionals and the public. Under her leadership, the number of unanimous decisions among the Supreme Court of Canada's nine justices has increased dramatically. Early in her career, she practiced law in Alberta and in British Columbia. She then taught for seven years as a tenured member of the faculty uh, at the University of British Columbia. Following her appointment to the bench, Chief Justice McLaughlin rose rapidly within the judiciary. In 1981, she was named to the Vancouver County Court and later that year was appointed to the Supreme Court of British Columbia. Four years later, she was elevated to the British Columbia Court of Appeal. Shortly thereafter, she became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of British Columbia. Within a year, she was sworn in as Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. She was appointed Chief Justice of that court, that court the country's highest, in 2000. In addition to her duties at the Supreme Court, she chairs the Canadian Judicial Council, the Advisory Council on the Order of Canada, and the Board of Governors of the National Judicial Institute. An author of numerous articles and publications, she received her bachelor's degree, her master's degree, and her law degree from the University of Alberta. New England Law Boston is honored to acknowledge Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin's distinguished career, her pioneering role as one of Canada's early women judges, and her leadership of the nation's highest court. As chairman of the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws with all of its privileges and responsibilities. Chairman Foster, Dean O'Brien, members of the Boards of Trustees, members of the faculty, and distinguished honorees, dear graduates, ladies and gentlemen. I am truly grateful for the honor New England Law has bestowed upon me today and for the privilege of joining this academic family and becoming a modest part of its remarkable history. Every individual has their own history and you, the graduates of 216, are at the beginning of forging your own histories. May they be as memorable as that of the law school from which you graduate. The history of New England Law Boston is truly a remarkable history, rooted in the quest for equality and the advancement of women. You know it better than I. The school traces its origins to 1908, 
and a time when many obstacles prevented women from practicing law. Two Boston women determined to sit the Massachusetts bar exam found a lawyer, Arthur Winfield McLean, to tutor them. Other students followed until finally a school was established. McLean's wife dubbed it Portia Law School after the heroine of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. The school thrived, as we all know, eventually offering legal education to both women and men in the spirit of true equality. We now know it as New England Boston, but privately I take great delight in thinking of it as Portia's Law School. About the same time, north of the border in Canada, not so far away, women were fighting similar battles. Canada's first female lawyer was a lady in Toronto named Claire Brett Martin. She faced a long struggle before she could be admitted to the bar. She was a mathematician, well-educated, but that didn't matter. Every conceivable barrier was put in Ms. Martin's path. She was refused permission to study law by the Law Society, just as those women here were refused permission to study law. And like them, she had to enlist the help of influential figures, including the Premier of Ontario, Sir Oliver Mowat, to pass legislation admitting women as barristers and solicitors. So she got to law school, but even then she faced hostility from male lecturers and students. And when she graduated from law school, the Law Society again tried to block her entry into the profession. Ms. Martin persevered. She placed first in the Law Society examinations, and on February 2nd, 1897, she became the first woman lawyer in the British Empire. Women like those who helped found Portia's Law School and like Ms. Martin, succeeded in breaking down barriers. They made it possible for women like me, like you in the audience, to pursue their desire to become lawyers and to speak, not just in the home, not just to children and family members, but in the courtrooms of the nation. They gave public voice to half of our population. In both the United States and Canada, women have fought the same fight and with the same result. And this is true not only of the fight for women's equality, but for many other causes. The right to live free from discrimination, the right to participate fully in society, the basic rights of liberty, equality, and freedom of expression. Which raises a question. Why is it that two very different countries with very different histories share so many commonalities? It's sometimes said that Canada has a lot of landscape, but it's a small nation in terms of population. We have just 37 million people as compared with 323 million in the United States. Canadians tend to look at the United States, States with mixed emotions, admiration, respect and awe, but also a little apprehension. If we, wa if we watch you more closely than you watch us, it's because we worry about how you may affect us more than you uh, worry about how we may affect you. Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of Canada's current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, once said that living next door to the United States was like sleeping with an, ele with an elephant. No matter how friendly and even-tempered is the beast, one is afflicted by every twitch and grunt. And, of course, we pray to God the elephant won't roll over. 
Yet, history suggests that Canada's anxiety about our neighbor to the south is misplaced. The United States and Canada share the longest undefended border in the world, a border unsullied by hostilities for more than two centuries. And that's a quite a good record when you think about it. Few countries in the world can claim such a record. The remarkable record of peaceful coexistence between our nations is attributable, I believe, in no small part to the fact that we share same common values. The values of liberty, equality, respect for the dignity of every human being, regardless of race, creed, or gender. It is also due to the precepts that we have devised to carry these values forward, the precepts of democracy and the rule of law. The commonality of values that unite our nations in peace is not the product of accident. It is a product of history. Before the United States and Canada were countries, they were both colonies of England. Their values were the values of the Magna Carta and the common law of England. In the late 1700s, the history of our nations diverged. The colonies to the south rebelled and went their own way. The colonies to the north remained true to the British clown to emerge as the independent nation of Canada only much later. The United States was born of revolution. Canada was born of evolution. But the common values that had nurtured the gestation of each nation determined what it would become. I spoke of the Magna Carta. A little more than 800 years ago, on a muddy field below Windsor Castle in England, the barons of England forced their king, King John, to sign a piece of parchment. King John, who was by all reputes an awful king, thought it a trifle. In fact, he immediately tried to renege on his contract. Yet the Magna Carta has endured and prevailed and ennobled our ideas of rights and law for over 800 years. Over the next 100 years, multiple copies were made and spread about England, spreading the idea, a revolutionary idea at the time, that the king and the king's government were subject to the law, not above the law, but subject to the law. The importance waxed and waned but in the 18th century, it was given new vigor in the battle between the king and the commons. Lord Cook, an English lawyer, was its chief champion. And he, at every occasion he could, he trotted out the charter's guarantees against the king's attempt to dictate his law, not the law of the country, not the law of the courts, as it was seen by Lord Cook but the king's wishes. And in the end, after a very long struggle, the Magna Carta and Lord Cook and his successors prevailed. They succeeded in using the Magna Carta to hone the ideas of individual liberty, democracy, and the rule of law. And as an aside to our graduates, the message that comes out of that for you is that you can take a simple